In this session, I'd like to talk about how to look at a company's dividend policy by est estimating how much the company could have paid in potential dividends and comparing it to the actual dividends paid by the company. The process is not difficult and it's actually very useful in explaining how companies end up with the cash balances that they do and why different companies come under different amounts of pressure to return that cash. The key number in this entire process is estimating the potential dividend, a number that I call the free cash flowed equity. But don't be intimidated by that term. The free cash flow equity is essentially the cash left over after you've met every conceivable need to the equity investors in the company. So to get to the free cash flow equity, you start with net income, which is after all, the equity measure of income. You add back depreciation and amortization because it's an accounting expense, but not a cash expense. And then you subtract out pretty much every expenditure you have as a company, including capital expenditures, working capital needs, debt payments of any, and new issues of debt actually act as cash inflows. What you're left with as your bottom line, the free cash flow equity is your potential dividend. If that number is a negative, negative number, you really can't afford to pay dividends or buy back stock based on what you did that year. If that number is a positive number, that is what you could have returned that year, and that is why it's a measure of potential dividends. Perhaps it's easier to see what we're doing by, by giving you two other ways of thinking about the free cash flow equity. In the first, which is the standard free cash flow equity rewritten, I start with net income as I did before, but then rather than add back depreciation and subtract out capex, I subtract out what's called net capex, which is basically what you're investing into your long-term assets. And then I subtract out change in non-cash working capital, which is what you reinvest back into short-term assets. And I cover some of this reinvestment with debt. And the way I compute that debt is I look at how much cash I brought in with new borrowings and I subtract out the debt I repaid. What I'm left with is the free cash flow equity. Here's another way of thinking about it. If a constant portion of my reinvestment is covered by debt, let's say 20% or 25%, there's a shortcut I can use. I can start with net income as I did before, and then rather than subtract out the entire net capex, I can subtract out only the equity portion of my net capex. So if my debt ratio is 25%, then 75% of my net capex will come from equity, and then subtract out the equity portion of my working capital needs, and what I'm left with is the free cash flow equity. But notice that the second approach can be used only if you have a constant debt to capital ratio. So here's how I use it at the end of the process. Once you've computed your free cash flow equity and you compared it to what the company actually returned in the form of dividends and buybacks, one of three things is going to be true. Your company could be one of those very unusual companies that returns exactly what it should in dividends and buybacks, in which case leave it alone. It could be one of those companies that pays out too little in dividends, in which case it's accumulating cash. And the key question then becomes whether you trust the managers in the company with your cash. To make that judgment, you have to look at the history. If, they, if they've historically delivered good projects for you and good stock returns, you're more likely to trust them with your cash. If they have a history of picking bad investments and delivering bad returns on your, on, on your investment, on your stock investment, you're more likely to demand your cash back. If they pay out too much, there again, the question you need to ask is what kind of investment opportunities do you have? Because if you have good projects and you pay out too much, you're doing double damage to yourself. First, you're digging a cash hole for yourself from which you've got to climb out. The second is you might actually reject some of those good investments because you don't have the cash. So if you have good projects and you're paying out too much, you have to figure out a way to pay out less and redirect that money into your projects. If you have bad projects and you pay out too much, then you have a double, uh, then you have two problems. One is an investment problem, which is you have taken bad investments, but that investment problem is creating a dividend problem, which is going to be tough to get out of. So to solve the dividend problem, you first have to solve the investment problem. So one way to think about where your company falls in this process is to look at it in a matrix, where on one axis, you look at the quality of your projects. On the other axis, you look at whether you paid out too much or too little in dividends. If you're a company with good projects, so you basically are in this quadrant, and you're accumulating cash, you have the flexibility to accumulate cash. If you're a company with bad projects and you accumulate cash, don't be surprised to come under pressure from stockholders to return that cash. If you're a company with good projects and you run a cash deficit, then you've got to figure out a way to cut back on the cash payout and essentially redirect the money to good projects. And if you're a company with an investment problem that is leading to a dividend problem, you've got to fix the investment problem first. So what I'd like to do actually is use this framework to look at Intel.
and I'm going to use the 2014 annual report to kind of bring this home. So here's a spreadsheet and it starts off with a question. How many years of historic data do you have available? For Intel, I have more than 10, but this sp spreadsheet is restricted 10 years, which is more than enough time anyway. If you have less than 10 years though, use as many years as you do have, seven, five, three, or even one year. So that's the first question. The second is, how many year, what, what is the existing debt to capital ratio? And what I want is a market debt to capital ratio. Basically, that'll be total debt, including lease commitments, divided by total debt plus market capitalization. For Intel, that number was 7.82% in 2014, and I'm going to leave it at that. However, I give you a choice if you want to override that number. If you want to override the number, just change the no to a yes and enter whatever you think is a reasonable target debt ratio. It could be the optimal, it could be what the company is aiming for. But if you're not sure, just leave it at no. Then I ask for numbers to compute the free cash flow equity. And here I'm going to go back and forth between the statement of cash flows for 2014, which is where you find most of these numbers, and the numbers themselves. So one of the, the things about the spreadsheet is year one is your most recent year, 2014, and then you work backwards. So I'm going to take 2014 and look up the net income from the statement of cash flows. It's right there, 11,704 million. Then comes depreciation amortization, and there are two numbers I'm going to use. One is the depreciation of 7,380 million, and the other is the amortization of 1,169. And if you add those two numbers up, you get a depreciation and amortization for the most recent year. Then you get to capital spending, and here I'm going to, I'm going to make your life a little difficult. If you look at addition to property, plant, and equipment, that's standard capex, it says minus 10,105. I'd like you to reverse the sign and just enter 10,105 because I'm going to be subtracting out this capital expenditure anyway. Then I'm going to also count in acquisitions and purchases of licensed technology because those look like investments in operating assets. Everything else under investing doesn't look like it's in operating assets, so I'm going to ignore it. So the cumulative amount here, all with the signs reversed, is 11,131 million. So that's the total capex in 2014. For the change in non-cash working capital, I'd like you to repeat this process of changing the sign. So if you look at 2014, accounts receivable created a negative cash flow of 861 million. What that effectively means is that accounts receivable increased by 861 million during the year. Here's what I'd like you to do. Open a bracket and inside the brackets, enter the, state of the cash flows from the statement of cash flows. Minus 861, minus 98, minus 249, plus four, and minus 286. The last one of the other assets and liabilities, I'm not going to count as part of working capital. So those are the five line items, but in, outside of the brackets, reverse the sign. So what I'm effectively going to be doing is taking the negative cash flow effect of working capital, which is minus 1,490 million, and showing it as a positive number, because that's the change, that's the increase in non-cash working capital of 1490, that's creating the negative cash flow. Finally, let's get to the net debt issue. If you go to the bottom in cash flows used by financing activities, the first number you see is increase in short-term debt, and you see a positive number. That basically means that Intel raised 235 million in new debt that year. You also see a 325 million that they raised in new debt in, two, in 2014, which I'm adding on, and they repaid 199 million in debt. The net number of 361 million basically is the net debt that they issued during the year, that is in fact going to be a that is going to essentially get to get get added back to your cash flows. So if you look at the numbers, here's what they look like in 2014. The net income of 11,704 is what I start with. The difference between capex and depreciation, which if you remember, is 11,131 minus 8,549 gets subtracted out. That's my investment in long-term assets. The increase in working capital it gets subtracted out, that's why it's a negative cash flow. I get 7,632 million as my cash flow before debt. The 361 million that I borrowed during the year, that's a positive, that's the inflow, gets added back. I get 7,993 million in free cash flow equity. I do this every year for the previous 10 years. Three of those years come from the statement of cash flows. The previous seven, I pull off a financial analysis summary that I printed off Bloomberg. If you don't have a Bloomberg, you might have to actually get the annual reports from previous years. But staying on that statement of cash flows, I also get two other numbers. 
The first is the dividends paid during the course of the year, which is 4,409, which again, I reverse the sign because I know it's a negative cash flow. And the stock buybacks of, of, of 10,792 and the 332 million, which added together gives me a total stock buyback of 11,117. Notice that I don't net out the issuance of new stock because I don't want to count the cash inflows from new stock issues as cash available to pay dividends. So I do that again every year for the previous 10 years. What you see in my final table is the numbers computed for the previous 10 years. And if you go down towards the bottom of the table, you see the summary numbers. Over the course of the 10 years, my net income aggregated to 135 billion. My dividends and buybacks were 95.7 billion. So as a percentage of net income, I returned 71%. My free cash or equity, if I don't count debt, is 115.7. If I count in the fact that I borrowed money during this period, it's a higher number, 128 billion. And if I use my 8% or 7.82% debt ratio, it's 117 billion. Basically, these numbers are the numbers you're focusing on because it shows you how much cash was returned as a percentage of my free cash or equity. To make a judgment on whether Intel's going to come under pressure, I first look at the return on equity. And it looks pretty impressive. It's much higher than the cost of equity. But to compute my return on equity, I had to go in and enter. And this, again, came from looking at past financials, the book value of equity each year. But the return on equity might be a little misleading because the buybacks of stocks might be pushing it up. What's less impressive is the return they've delivered on my stock, which I compute based upon the annual return each year and what I should have made each year based on my beta, the risk-free rate, and the return on the market each year. So basically what I do to compute my expected return is I take the risk-free rate each year plus the beta times the return in the market that year minus the risk-free rate. It uses the actual return in the market because I'm looking backwards. Overall, Intel looks like it's picked good projects based on its accounting return, but the market's not been impressed. That's, that's a mixed it's a mixed conclusion on Intel. It might have good projects, but the project quality is not as good as the market thought it was going to be. The net result of all of this is Intel has accumulated some cash, but not too much cash over the period. So I'm not going to get too excited. It's had good projects, but not the projects haven't been as good as expected. The stock return hasn't been as good. Overall, I don't think Intel will come under incredible pressure to pay, pay, return the cash. But if its stock returns don't improve, it will start to come under increasing pressure. That's a subjective judgment, but that's a way you use these past years to make a judgment about what will happen in the future. Incidentally, on the same spreadsheet, you can make forecasts for the future and come up with forecasted dividends and free cash or equity for the future years. Think of it as the cash that's going to be available for stock buybacks in future years. So if you get a chance, try this out in your company because it can give you a starting point at least on analyzing the dividend policy of your company.